Welcome to Beat Diabetes, and we're going to talk today about, well, what we always talk about, how to beat diabetes, how to keep those glucose levels low and the insulin levels as well. Before we go much further, and we're going to get to those two so-called healthy foods that are terrible in raising your blood sugar, but before we get to that, I want to talk a little bit about an old friend. The old friend, well, it's not Dr. Atkins because he has passed away and I never knew him, never met the man. But this book is an old friend because this was one of the ways that God steered me out of high blood sugar and into normal blood sugar. So uh, I, I don't really remember if this is the original book that I read or if I ended up losing that and bought this as a replacement. I have a feeling this is the original one. And one thing you can notice, I don't know if you can see it from the camera, but uh, I've got a lot of red marks all over this book, especially in the first part. And, uh, well, maybe not a lot, but some <laughs> anyway. Uh, but I, this was kind of an eye-opener. Now, Dr. Dr. Atkins' book, and this was actually his uh, second, uh, his big major revision of the original book, which was Diet Revolution. This is called The New Diet Revolution. And uh, this was just a, a huge bestseller. It was, it's the original, I think, sold something like 10 million copies. Can you believe that? Millions of copies. Now, I've sold a couple books myself. Uh, they did not approach millions of copies. I was kind of proud that my second book, 60 Ways to Lower Your Blood Sugar, reached about a quarter of a million copies, about 250,000. But his sold millions and affected millions of people. So this was made a huge splash. And the amazing thing is the original book uh, was written at a time where nobody was preaching or believing in a low-carb, high-fat diet or even a high-protein diet. Uh, everybody was saying, get the fat way down low, lower still, lower still, until there's almost no fat in your diet. And then everything else is fair game. And so you had all these food manufacturers getting the fat, fat down low so they could proudly announce low fat, and then they would just dump the sugar in so you'd enjoy it. And it, the result was just a disaster for Americans and their health. And we exported that all over the world. The low-fat craze was a, a tremendously failed experiment uh, with the idea that our problem is too much fat. Well, I wanted to share a few quotes about uh, uh, from this book. Uh, a lot of people today... Uh, because this was written a long time ago, doctor, I don't remember when Dr. Atkins died. He died of a fall. He was on an icy parking lot, if I remember correctly, and he fell and hit his head and died a few days later. So uh, I, I don't know how long that has been, but uh, the Atkins craze, it's been quite a while. So the, during the Atkins craze, low carb was in, in style. It was in vogue. It was cool. And then after a while, it kind of went downhill and you didn't hear hardly anything about it. And then the keto craze came along and suddenly everything is low carb and everything is labeled keto these days. Obviously not everything, but a lot of stuff is. So Dr. Adkins made a huge impact at a time when almost nobody was saying this. Yeah, there were some, of course. But he was the number one guy. He was the, the vanguard leader. And there were a couple of reasons for this. Number one, he, he pushed this not so much about diabetes, but he pushed it as a way to lose weight. And everybody and their mama is trying to lose weight. So this book became huge because, number one, it was offering the chance to lose weight. And number two, it worked. Uh, number one doesn't count if number two isn't in, uh, in effect. But it worked. And people found that it worked, and they told their neighbors, and they told their friends, and their church members, and everybody else. And before long, millions of people were doing the Atkins diet. That did die down. But I just want to share a few things. I think the tendency today is to say, well, Atkins, what did he know? He, he lived several decades ago. His book was big in the 90s, and uh, the first book was, I think, written in the 70s when nobody wanted to hear about that. And the, the climate was absolutely hostile to low-carb eating, but it still made a huge splash, again, because it worked. But I want to suggest 
that Atkins is not so old school that he's not relevant anymore. About 90 some percent of what he says is still absolutely relevant. Uh, there's a few things I might disagree with or Dr. Fung might disagree with or Dr. Berry might disagree with, but most of what he says is still right on you know, 30 years later or, or more. So let's just share a few things. Let me give you a good example of this. Atkins talks about why his diet works, and he says this, Atkins works as an increasing body of scientific evidence shows that it corrects the basic factors that controls obesity and influences risk factors for certain illnesses. That factor is excessive levels of insulin. So Atkins, some people think, well, Atkins didn't know anything about insulin and hyperinsulinemia. Yeah, he did. He knew quite a bit about it and he wrote about it. So the idea that this idea of hyperinsulinemia originated with Dr. Jason Fung is not true. In fact, you don't want to, want to know what my guess is, and I can't prove this, but it's a guess. My guess is that Dr. Jason Fung read this book early on as he was transitioning from a traditional doctor to the doctor that he is today where he preaches low carb and intermittent fasting. I would be extremely surprised if I found out he never read this book. And I would be almost just as surprised if I found out it didn't happen early on and was an influential factor. Maybe I'm wrong. And if you know him, you can ask him. But I would be surprised. Yeah, he knew about excess insulin. He says excess insulin is behind all kinds of illnesses. Yep, exactly right, Dr. Atkins. He says all uh, an essential hormone, insulin, governs the basic mechanism by which the body lays on fat. So he's saying insulin creates storage of fat, something we're hearing all over the place to this very day. Uh, wasn't such a Stone Age guy after all. He, he says, we medical folks call that state hyperinsulinism. Today, uh, we've changed it a bit. We call it hyperinsulinemia, but same thing. He says, insulin vigorously promotes the development of diabetes. Uh, yeah, that's exactly what everybody is saying that's in the low carb camp these days. Hyperinsulinemia, excess insulin, too much insulin because you got too high a blood sugar and your pancreas is pumping its little guts out to try to keep up and producing all kinds of insulin and boom, here comes diabetes and boom, here comes obesity and boom, here comes atherosclerosis and boom, here comes hypertension. Yep, Atkins figured it out long before any of these guys that you probably follow even had a clue about it. He says it promotes development of diabetes, atherosclerosis, and hypertension. More recently, it's been linked to the increased risk of breast cancer and polycystic ovarian syndrome. We could also talk about type 3 diabetes, Alzheimer's, and uh, various forms of mental degeneration that's happening long before it should, if it ever should. And of course, there are many suggesting that it even plays a role in some or maybe even most cancers. High insulin along with high glucose, it's the double whammy. It is the, the left-right punch of metabolic syndrome that comes when your blood sugar is too high and your insulin therefore becomes too high. And you're going around your life day to day, week by week, month by month, year by year, your glucose is too high, your insulin is too high, you are destroying your body, you're hurting your mind, you're affecting all kinds of issues, and as a result, you become obese, you have high blood sugar, high blood pressure, and uh, all kinds of things. So, Atkins knew this long before most of the guys that you follow know it, and we have to get, give him some kudos, give him some credit. Uh, so much in this book, you know, I, I haven't read this in a long time. I've glanced at it here and there, but just looking it over a little more thoroughly today than I have before in, in a long time, I'm like, man, he knew so much before anybody else did. Here is another example of Dr. Atkins speaking about what he calls hyperinsulinism. Today, we call it hyperinsulinemia. He says, simply put, hyperinsulinism is the condition that results from too much insulin produced by your body. Too much insulin. 
He says it's easy to see how this might happen when you realize there's a relationship between the kinds of foods you eat and the amount of insulin in your bloodstream. Stop, rewind. There's a link between what you put in your mouth and how much insulin is floating around. And if you understand that excess insulin is bad news, it's disaster, it's catastrophe, it is the road to all kinds of medical calamities and health calamities, then if you all, it should stand to reason that if you alter the food you put in your mouth, and you eat foods that are not going to provoke much insulin, your health ought to improve. He says foods rich in carbohydrates, well, surprise, surprise, especially sugar, honey, milk, and fruit that contain, and foods that contain simple sugars, refined carbohydrates such as flour, white rice, and potato starch are readily absorbed through the stomach. They speedily convert to glucose. When these foods are eaten in excess, they require a lot of insulin for transport. But, he says, foods made of protein and fat, on the other hand, require little or no insulin. Rewind, foods that are mostly protein and fat require little or no insulin. Again, this is written like in the 90s or, yeah, I think it was in the early 90s when he wrote this and they made uh, a few more printings up through around 2000 or 2002. But long before anybody else seemed to be saying this much, Dr. Atkins got this right. Okay, let's answer the question that the thumbnail raises, which is the two foods that are considered healthy but provoke blood sugar like crazy. He quotes a couple of researchers, Simon Liu and Walter Willett, and he says Liu and Willett and other researchers have found that two foods contribute most to elevating blood sugar to an excessive level called the glycemic load. And he's not, I mean, these are two foods beyond just pure sugar. Obviously, pure sugar will do that. But here are two foods that do it just about as well. They're almost as efficient in raising your blood sugar as pure sugar. But if you ate these foods, you wouldn't think you were doing anything harmful. Most people wouldn't. They would assume they're healthy. What are those two foods? Number one, baked potatoes. They will jack up your blood sugar just about like sugar would. And if you don't believe that, get yourself a glucose meter and try it out and test it about an hour and 15 minutes after you eat a baked potato. And then take a glass of water and put in about nine teaspoons of sugar, stir it all up and drink that and test yourself about an hour and 15 minutes later. I doubt there'll be much difference between the sugar water and the baked potato. So that's food number one, a baked potato. People think a baked potato is so healthy, so natural. Well, it may be natural. It's not healthy for most people, especially once you cross <laughs> into middle age. Uh, you're just not going to handle that kind of a food very well. What's the other food? Cold breakfast cereal. You say, he's saying researchers have found that cold breakfast cereal will do it as well. And a lot of those cereals, I don't think they're doing this so much anymore, but they used to have a heart-healthy check on them, telling you they're good for you, good for your heart, good for your body. Feel noble when you eat that cereal. Feel righteous. Feel morally superior to someone eating some eggs and bacon because you're eating healthy breakfast cereal. Maybe it's mueslix, maybe it's bran flakes, or even if it's tricks or Fruit Loops, at least you're not eating those nasty old eggs and bacon. And yet, if you test your blood sugar, you find that that cold breakfast cereal is jacking up your blood sugar in a way that eggs and bacon never will. You could test yourself once, a dozen times, or 10,000 times, and the cold breakfast cereal will always spike your blood sugar, not just slightly more than eggs and bacon, but multiple times more. In fact, the eggs and bacon will hardly move the needle on your blood sugar, but boy, that cold breakfast cereal will. You say, well, I'll just heat it up. <laughs> that won't make any difference. So those are two, and I could give you more examples, but, and he goes on to talk about the glycemic index. Now, this is one place where I don't fully agree with him because there are foods that boast about being low on the glycemic index, and yet they will jack up your blood sugar a lot. So to me, the answer to beating diabetes, the answer to keeping spikes low, the answer to keeping glucose steady 
is not to go around looking for things that brag about being low glycemic index. It's to test yourself. But for, for starters, just give up all sugars and nearly all starches. Just give up on those and go with the, the, uh, the vegetables and go with meat. And then you'll find some other things. A lot of high fat dairy products will be okay. Milk is not okay. It's got too much sugar in it. But when you turn milk into cream, somehow the sugar goes down and it works. But a lot of people have been fooled because they've been told certain things are healthy for them. And their glucose meter, the guy I call Mike, he tells them, nope, these do not work at all for you. Now, in many cases, that's true for people that aren't even diabetic. They may be pre-diabetic. They may be pre-pre-diabetic. And yet, if they test, they'll find they, they spike up to 160, 180 eating some of these foods. And all the more so if you're fully diabetic or if you've ever been diabetic. You just can't go back to those old ways. I know some people say, well, I don't count it as beating diabetes Unless I can go back to the way I ate when I was 22 years old, baby, 22 years old, and I stuffed all kinds of stuff. I want to be able to eat ice cream. I want to be able to drink soda. I want to be able to eat heaping mounds of rice and monster-sized baked potatoes and candy bars. And if I can't do that and, and keep my blood sugar in line, then I'm not healed. Well, you're just dumb. <laughs> Let me say, I know that's not very polite. But if you think beating diabetes means going back to the way you ate when you were 22, which you were probably getting spikes back then, many of you were, but you can't go back to that. You never can. And the older you get, the more likely it is that you're going to have to be very careful in what you eat. Some things just change when you get older. Here's a newsflash. Some things, say it with me now, some things just change when you get older. I'm around 70 years of age. And if you put me in a foot race with a 22-year-old, chances are I'll lose. If you put me in a foot race with 22-year-old Dennis, and I can go back in time and race Dennis when he was 22, I will lose all over the place. 22-year-old Dennis would beat me terribly in a race. I don't see as well as I did when I was young. And uh, there's all kinds of things that just don't work as well, and you have to adjust. It's called adjustment. It's called adaptation. And one of the ways you have to adjust is to avoid foods that spike your glucose. And the older you get, the more you may have to be a bit severe on which food you allow and which ones you don't. The good news is if you'll just keep moderating and adapting, you can keep good glucose levels, have a great A1C, a great fasting glucose all the way into your 70s. How do I know? Because I'm about to turn 70, and my A1C is 5.0. My fasting glucose is usually under 100, often under 90. It's better than it would have been had I tested it when I was 48, which I didn't test when I was in my mid to la uh, latter 40s. So you can do it, but you're going to have to make some adjustments. I want you to know that I have another YouTube channel. It's called by my name, Dennis Pollock. And on this channel, my wife, Benedicta, and I teach the basics of the Bible in a simple, user-friendly fashion. Normally, on Mondays, I post what I call a video devo, in which I take various Bible topics and share scriptures to help you understand the subject a little better. On Thursdays, I post Bible studies by Benedicta and me as we sit at our dining room table and discuss various portions of the scriptures. We cover book studies and Bible character studies. This next Thursday, we will be uploading the first of a number of studies we did on the amazing and mysterious book of Daniel. So catch me on Mondays sharing devotional talks and Benedict and me on Thursdays as we study the greatest book in the world, the Bible. Check in the description to find a link to our Bible teaching channel, which is called by my name, Dennis Pollock.